Good evening, UVA. Woo! I'm Scott Beardsley, Dean of the Darden School of Business, and I'm delighted to welcome the New York Times to Darden for this fantastic event. I also want to welcome to UVA, the UVA and Darden students in the room. Go Hoos! Woo! Woo! And welcome to the college students watching at campuses around the United States and the world. We are thrilled today to have UVA alumnus Alexis Ohanian, a pioneer in technology with us. He co-founded Reddit right here at the University of Virginia with his roommate, Steve Huffman. It was great seeing Alexis recently cheering on the Virginia men's basketball team to the national championship. Let's hear it for the Hoos. Tonight we're going to talk about entrepreneurship, responsible innovation, and technology, areas that are at the heart of the Darden experience. We hope that the college students here in the audience will check out Darden and learn more about our programs such as the Future Year program. We are delighted to be with you tonight. Thank you so much, Alexis. Thank you, Sapna. And thank you to the New York Times. Please join me now in welcoming Megan K. Safer from the New York Times. Good evening, everyone. I'm Megan K. Safer with the New York Times, and I'm so pleased to welcome you to Get With the Times, our live conversation series for college students. Hosted by top journalists paired with famous figures in entertainment, politics, sports, business, and more, the series is all about inspiring young people to get involved in the issues that matter to them the most. Tonight's program features tech investor and entrepreneur Alexis Ohanian. As co-founder of Reddit, Alexis has permanently shaped the landscape of the web. He's funded over 100 startups as co-founder and managing partner of Initialized Capital, an early stage venture capital firm that has over 500 million under management. Alexis is also the author of a best-selling book, Without Their Permission. Tonight's conversation will be moderated by Sapna Maheshwari, a business reporter for the New York Times. Before joining the Times in 2016, Sapna covered retail and e-commerce at BuzzFeed News and Bloomberg News and contributed to Bloomberg Business Week. Before we get started, the Times would like to thank our host, the University of Virginia and the Darden School of Business, our collegiate partner, Her Campus, and all of the college students on campuses across the country who are hosting watch parties and tuning in to tonight's live stream. You'll hear from some of them later this evening. Please join me in welcoming Sapna and Alexis. This is great. Ooh, this is exciting. Y'all came out for this. I was, Loki, I was a little nervous because Darden and Grounds, you know, geographically not next door to each other. So, so thank you for all y'all who came out. You must have really had nothing else to do tonight. <laughs> but I appreciate it. Very modest. No, um, I, I'm, I'm, I've had, I've definitely turned up for some of these college appearances. This must be the New York Times because I've turned up for some college appearances and had like six kids in an auditorium. <laughs> yes, it's very the humbling. Time, the Times will take full credit for this. Yeah, right on. Um, but to kick things off, mm -hmm. thank you guys so much for being here in person, mm -hmm. and thank you to all of the folks who are streaming um, from campuses across the US and tuning in that way. Technology is amazing, as we mm -hmm. will discuss. Mm -hmm. um, and just to give you a little layout of the event, um, I'm going to interview Alexis for about 30 minutes, and then we are going to go to questions in person. and from video from students here and across the US. Great. So a lot of chances to grill, Alexis. Well, I heard Virginia Tech is one of the universities that's tuning in via live stream. <laughs> no, Where's the no, camera? Lost. Which one, where would they be? Where, if I want to look at the camera. Is that over there? All right. Not positive. What's up, Hokies? Nothing but love. <laughs> we just, uh, <laughs> Uh, 
It's a good, it feels, feels good. It feels good. I, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I, I picked this up in Minneapolis. Uh, oh my God, I'm still floating. Y'all, <laughs> half of y'all are probably still tipsy from that celebration. Oh, oh man, I won't wow. wear this the whole time. So we, this is we just started taunt. tonight with a heavy troll. This is just troll. a taunt tech, there you go. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I wasn't even going to ask you about trolling till later in this, oh. uh, in, in this right, but well, I'm glad we kicked it. off with that there in this it. safe space. And the, they're streaming. I mean, from far it's away. all right. They'll be tweeting at me. I have nothing but love for the Hokies, but. Uh, oh, yeah, it's nice gotta, to be on top. You got to bring that up. Yeah. I, full disclosure I went to UNC yeah. Chapel Hill, so I have a yeah. strong, Great school. strong appreciation Great for college school. basketball, and congrats on the win. Fantastic school. All right, well, I think a good jumping off point for us today, Alexis, is right. to ask you to mentally teleport yourself back to your undergraduate days in Charlottesville. Okay. It was the early 2000s. Where was young Alexis hanging out? What classes were you excited about? And what were you doing on the weekends? OK. Uh, so we're talking like first year? Um, you can aggregate it. OK. I mean, roughly, I was still finding my way. Uh, for sure, I was pre-med for a week, like a lot of kids. <laughs> and I signed up for the wrong class. I took, I took a chemistry class. I showed up the first day, and they were like, how many of you have already taken, I guess it was bio. No, it was bio. It was, yeah, it was, it was a bio class. How many of you have already taken chem? Every hand goes up. Mine didn't. And they were like, you should probably leave. So I left, <laughs> and big auditorium. And I left, and I was like, well, I can't take that now. And I picked uh, ancient Greek history with Professor Lendon. And <laughs> right? And I didn't know what I was signing up for. I was just like, I like ancient Greek history, right? That sounds cool. And, and I fell in love with the class. I declared my history major by the end of my first semester, first year, which is insane. And I remember at the history department, they were like, are you sure? And I was like, yes, of course I want a degree in history. Like, this is going to change my life. It'll give me everything I need for all endless career opportunities. And they were like, That's, that makes sense. We hear that a lot here at the history department. <laughs> And no, they, they, uh, they were a little surprised, but I, I, I definitely overachieved. Um, I, I mean, I ended up double majoring and I had a minor and I really, I spent a lot of time in Alderman Library, which I loved, but I, I was, I, I came to UVA as uh, basically the first, I mean, my mother got a GED, my dad went to a hippie school called Antioch, which actually lost its charter. So I was like the first kid in the family, like I was, and I was the only child, so I was the one going to college, and it was like important. And my great aunt Vera paid for it all. She saved, didn't have any kids, saved up all her money as a school teacher in Brooklyn to make sure I didn't have to have student loan debt. And so when I showed up here, I was like, I really gotta earn it. I gotta get on Vera's money's worth. So I really over-indexed on classes and worried way too much about my GPA because I thought I was going to be a lawyer. Uh, then I walked out of that LSAT and went to the Waffle House in 29, uh, <laughs> which changed my life because then I was like, if I like waffles more than the law, I probably shouldn't be a lawyer. And, and then I decided I needed to come up with something to do and, and then convince my roommate to start a company with me, um, which would end up being Reddit. And so lots of serendipitous things happen, um, but I was a very, I mean, I, I still had fun but I wish I had given myself more freedom to care less about my GPA and be more experimental, um, taking classes that I, I avoided because I just thought like, okay, well, if I wanna get these two majors and I wanna get this minor, I have to, I, I can't take a random class in philosophy because that's not gonna apply towards my graduation, so let's not bother. Um, but, uh, I, and I also had this really awkward, like, chin beard, kind of like How an Abe. chin beard play It was like an that? Abe Lincoln. <laughs> Look, so if I could, I don't think you asked me if I could do it all over again or what I would do differently, but that is something I would have done differently um, um, as well. I'm impressed that you volunteered that embarrassing piece The photo of is somewhere on the internet, so <laughs> y'all were going to find it anyway. Well, I'm glad you started talking about this with the LSAT, um, mm -hmm. because one of my questions was, you know, when you came here from Baltimore, you didn't know quite what you wanted to do, then you thought you might want to be a lawyer. You took the LSAT and mm -hmm. were so traumatized, you decided that was it. Oh, I, I think a lot of people. The first section. Get, I was 30 minutes oh, okay. out. So you actually just quit the LSAT. I walked out. Yeah. Um, so yeah. When, when did that start evolving and when did you start seeing a path as an entrepreneur? Uh, my, my pops had a, tra he started a travel agency at literally the worst possible time because it was in the late 90s, right as the dot-com boom was taking off and like online travel agencies were drinking all of his milkshake. And he used to come home 
really upset, understandably, um, because you know his his commissions from the airlines were going to zero, and and this thing, the internet, which I was using to like build websites for fun for like my video game teams, and and I was actually had this little hustle where I was um, building websites for nonprofits for free. Um, because it actually just felt really cool to have these adults coming to me for help building a thing that they couldn't do. And, and at, the, at the time I thought the internet was a cool toy and I could do this fun stuff, um, but it was there at the dinner table that I saw. It was changing his entire industry. And this was the industry that created the job for him and his small company that put food on the table. And, and I, I, at some point during that, realized, one, okay, dad's demystified the entrepreneurship thing. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it, uh, a small business, but still like a, a startup. And, uh, and whatever I end up doing um, needed to be powered by software or the internet, because I've seen what happens when I'm on the other end of it. And, and I didn't want to be on the other end of it. Um, and so I think, I think having that exposure helped a lot. But then ultimately, deciding to start a startup was, was the, the best looking alternative to being a lawyer, which I'd already decided I didn't want to do. And, uh, and I figured, well, what's the worst that could happen? Like, I, I spent a couple of years, like I said, I was lucky enough to graduate without any student loan debt, which is a, a privilege that I wish would be afforded to every one of our students. Um, but, uh, but so I had the freedom to say, look, if two years of my life later, I've started a company and I've failed, I mean, that's basically a free MBA. No offense, Darden. <laughs> But, but, but I could see myself going into the meeting with my future employer and having my future boss ask me, like, what'd you do the last two years? And I could say, I started a company, I failed miserably, but I learned these things. And I would hope that she would say, all right, that's cool, that's great. That is a good use of your time. That's what we're looking for here at Blah Bitty Blah Corp. And it wouldn't be so bad. Which is, I mean, I feel like there is a sense of invincibility you get senior year that, I don't know mm -hmm. if, I, I have ever felt the amount of confidence I felt senior mm, year of college. There's that swagger. Right? It's that fourth year swagger. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, what do you think you picked up at UVA that you still use and work today and that helped mm -hmm. you in those first years of starting Reddit? Um, Outside of your roommate, which you hit the jackpot. Yeah. Yeah. Very much lucked out there. Um, I, think, I think what I got here that armed me so well was, and, and this is you know, credit to that history degree, was an ability to take lots of disparate data, primary sources, uh, uh, the, the sort of later uh, kind of synthesized third, third party accounts, um, to take all these things and synthesize them into an idea about how a complex thing can, can kind of be grasped and understood, and then be able to communicate that idea. That, to me, is 90% of my job as a founder, as a CEO, as an investor now, is looking out at a bunch of disparate data and trying to figure out where the, the sort of truths are, as messy as they are, and, and make decisions and then communicate those decisions. And so, I, um, as much as I advocate for learning to code, like it is literally, it is the new literacy, it is one of the most valuable skills you can learn. Um, that does not mean excluding a lot of the things in the humanities that make us well-rounded, that let us be effective communicators, that, that really, I, I would argue, differentiate, um, set people apart. The, the ones, if, if your goal in some way, shape, or form is to, to change the world, um, however you see that happening, um, being able to communicate effectively has to be some part of that. Um, and, and being able to understand complex ideas and, and, and do the things that a, a humanities education can, can do for you is, is core to that. Um, and then frankly also, UVA showed me for the first time a little bit of a glimpse outside of my bubble. You know, as a, like, <laughs> it's kind of easy for any, any of y'all who got here, you were probably top of your class or like pretty high up there in, in wherever you were going to school beforehand. And so you show up here at UVA thing and like you're a great programmer because uh, you, you were the, you know, the star pupil in your Pascal high, sc high school Pascal class. It's archaic programming language, but that was what I was learning. And then you show up here and you're like, oh, no, I am not that smart. Uh, <laughs> and, and that's a humbling and important thing um, that, that I feel when universities are functioning at their best, um, they both humble you and then they force you to kind of break out of your 
your your your mold uh, from wherever you came because you're you're forced to live. I hope still you're forced to live first year with people who you don't necessarily know um, and who hopefully do have a diverse set of backgrounds and experiences and who will introduce you to different things uh, that range from the like more sort of superficial to like different food or music to the more serious, which is different perspectives and experiences. And, uh, and that's a thing that it, it only happens when you kind of force, when you force it to happen. And, and this is a beautiful place to be able to do it. I mean, aesthetically, it's a really beautiful place to be able to do it. I very much relate to that. I think that's great advice. Um, okay, so you've done a whole lot since you co-founded Reddit with your fellow Wahoo. I did that right, right? Wahoo. Okay. Yeah. You yeah, the Wahoo, I actually don't even know the origin of it. Is I know because it's a fish, but that's not a thing, right? Why? It's a fish that drinks twice its own body weight. Okay, but is that why we're called Wahoos? <laughs> no. Thank you. Please. Stop it. That, wow. Thank you. Today I learned. Ooh, I saw Who that knew? on Google. I think it was W and L. I like how we embrace that. It was Washington Lee? That's what I read on wow. Google. Whoa. Cards, okay, thank which you are very not much. always reliable. Okay, and a fish to drink side. I don't know which way you're going with that one. Well, uh, um, as what of course you mean is stay hydrated because that's really important. Drink lots of water. I'm going to try and get myself back on track. Yeah, so, anyway, yes. so you've but done the, a lot. The exclamation you use when you see a fellow Wahoo is Wahoo Wah. Wahoo we still wah. say that, right? Am I the old guy? Okay. We'll end on that later. All right, good. Okay. So hold it in. Okay. Um, so <laughs> All right. So you co-founded a venture capital firm. Yeah. You wrote a best-selling book. Mm -hmm. You hosted and appeared on a lot of podcasts when I was searching mm -hmm. podcasts. You lobbied the FCC, and you uh, even married a tennis player that some people may have heard of. It's the reason they're all here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. I know, I know, right? I did that. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you became a father. Yes, we made a baby. And you became the grandfather to this interesting doll on Instagram. And you are how yeah. old? Uh, 35. To... Okay, 36, cool. I feel yeah, 36 April 24th. <laughs> Almost 36. Congratulations. Thank you. I made it. Almost. Um, well, I'd love to talk more about your VC firm and the VC world. But first, um, if you could just tell us a little bit about what your involvement in Reddit is now mm -hmm. um, and how that's kind of changed in the past few years because I think yeah. you know people don't always know that you've stepped back kind of from the day-to-day. -day. Yeah, so we started it in 05. We sold it in 06. I left in 10. I went to go volunteer in Armenia back in the motherland. Hey, Badev, what's up? Hey. Oh, hey. Um, I had never been and, and I was like, I'm going to go and be useful. And so I was a volunteer for Kiva and I just kind of got away from things for a bit. And then um, came back to Reddit as like a board member in like 11, came back to the company full time in 14 to help lead the turnaround. The company was then taken independent away from Condé Nast. And then um, a year ago, after we had, we had raised a pretty significant round of funding um, and the company was in a much better place, uh, I went back to the board so that I could come back to initialize full time. So today I am a, a board member, but don't have a full time role because I'm doing initialized. Maybe you could explain to everyone what a board member does. Uh, what does a board member do? A board member uh, convenes quarterly for board meetings, um, but, but importantly helps set, actually we got a lot of MBA folks here, you could probably tell me better, but importantly <laughs> represents, represents shareholders and, and is an advocate for their long-term best interests um, and sort of serves as a check and balance on the CEO. Very interesting. So um, you co-founded Initialized Capital, um, which is a, quote, early stage venture capital firm. Mm. Can you explain that to me like I'm your relative at Thanksgiving who doesn't spend a lot of time online? For sure. I, I am looking for, uh, I, I, I want to be the first person, or we at Initialized want to be the first people to write a check to invest in a founder and believe in him or her and work with him or her to build something that I hope one day will be bigger and better than Reddit, that will be a massive business, and, and uh, that's it. It's an amazing job because I get to spend all my time talking to entrepreneurs who are makers, who are builders, who tell me what they think the future is going to look like, and I have, I mean, we have the privilege of being able to, to get to work with the ones that we're most excited to work with, 
and roll up our sleeves and help them do everything from like designing a logo. I drew all the logos for our companies, including. I made Snoo actually while I was bored in McIntyre, uh, <laughs> my, my fourth year, our little Reddit alien. Um, and, and, and help them, give them guidance that we wish we had had when we were starting out. Um, so it's a very fun job and not at all like Shark Tank. <laughs> Which we'll get to in a minute. Okay. So what, um, what are some of the companies that you've invested in? Um, I'm trying to think of ones. Y'all use Instacart? Is that a thing? Yeah, okay. So we were the first investors in Instacart. Uh, my partner, Gary, was pitched uh, a, a very janky app that had like an inventory that the the creator of Porva had scraped from Safeway, and you could kind of do checkout, and then there were two drivers hired off a of Craigslist that would actually do the picking and the delivery, and it was, it was magic. This was the first time you could just kind of touch a couple of buttons and have the groceries show up. Um, another one would be Coinbase. Um, they were the, they're sort of the crypto bank, uh, and back in like 2011 or 12, Brian Armstrong, who's the CEO, said, you know what, this is gonna be, this is gonna be a potentially big deal. Um, and we're going to be the bank for handling cryptocurrency. And uh, it's, it, it's the kind of thing that seems, it, it seems outlandish until it starts working and then you know, continues to grow and, and be successful. But um, it's, it's fun. It's a, lot of, uh, it's a lot of good dinner table conversations. Uh, I have a high bar with my wife, and I want to have, have some good fodder for Olympia, my daughter, to hear. <laughs> And, and so being able to talk about working with these founders and, and, and businesses that I think can have a really big impact uh, is pretty fun. So we've been, we've been off to a good start. Well, I'm glad you mentioned that Coinbase was outlandish until it started working because mm -hmm. I'm curious, I mean, how do you parse the ideas that are really far-fetched and maybe too far-fetched for you to handle to something that you're like, okay. I mean, because I remember first hearing about crypto and yeah. it's kind of overwhelming. Yeah, no, there's definitely a, um, I don't know how to describe it, but there, there's the, the, the really big ideas are the ones that, especially at that stage, when they are still so nascent, seem to really push up on the boundaries of, of what feels, uh, comfortable is not the right word, but like normal, like it just seems just, it's, it's sort of on the cusp of outlandish. Um, there was a company, uh, oh, Patreon, which, like had a really st standard, straightforward process that seemed really crazy to a lot of the people that we were explaining it to. Um, uh, so Patreon's a way to basically do like micro patronage. So um, you know, if you've got an artist that you love on YouTube, instead of them having to rely on YouTube ad dollars, which are nothing, um, you pledge to give them some dollar, maybe a dollar a month, three dollars a month, so they can be making content. In exchange, they'll make, you know, you'll get a special thank you note, or you'll, you'll get some special access digitally to uh, unreleased video. And it's the kind of thing where there's a precedent for it. I mean, Michelangelo is not on his back for four years painting a ceiling unless someone was paying for his bills. And back then, he had the Medici's. Renaissance, any? No. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> But like, it's, it, it, it is a thing that has existed historically where there's a, there's a precedent um, where it just took technology to say, look, not everyone needs to be a Medici. If we use software, we can divide this up so you can have a bunch of smaller contributors. And patronage is a concept. So, like so many of these ideas, even, even crypto, everything is a remix. Um, it's still, it, there are very few things that are truly original but it's the original application and sort of allocation of resources and, and whatnot that makes the, the novel idea. But, uh, but at the time, a lot of people yeah, thought it was bonkers. Why would I pay a dollar a month to some guy in Oklahoma who does a cappella video game theme music songs? Um, incidentally, his name is Smooth McGroove, and if, <laughs> if you've ever watched, watch his a cappella video game theme song videos. I mean, it's... He's very talented. Well, I, I said Ben Folds he's is even talented. on it. I mean, I, that he's guy's got his, a good thing going. His email list. Right? But, I mean, he's pretty famous, and he's on pay, I, Patreon, too, I now. think, um, I mean, seven years ago, I think that would have surprised a lot of folks. Yeah. Um, but the reality is, um, you know, obviously, that whole, the whole industry for the creatives has shifted drastically because of the internet. And, and the other thing that's emerged is someone who is very niche, who never would have gotten a record deal. I mean, God bless Ben Folds. I hit, and I don't know about the other five or what that situation is now, but like they, they made it, right? They took the trip to LA or I guess wherever it was and they got discovered. But a guy like Smooth, I mean, he's not going to LA. 
You can watch his videos. Like, he's not, no, no L.A. record guy is going to be like, that's the guy. He's going to be big. Move over Beyonce. Like, it's smooth McGroove. But, but that's okay because, because he has a following. He has an audience. And he's a creator who now makes his living in Oklahoma making his art. He doesn't have to work a barista job to pay the bills. He doesn't have to do some job he hates to pay the bills. He can actually make his weird but talented art and, and make a living from it. And, and that doesn't need to be, uh, it doesn't have to work through the traditional model and, and we're, we're reinventing it. Uh, and it's just, it, again, it's, this is the stuff, I'm really just trying to come up with, with good stories to be able to tell my daughter um, because I want, I, I want to be able to bring home those dinner table stories of, of, of entrepreneurship and curiosity and, and, and interesting stuff because I mean, my wife just has better stories right now, and I <laughs> got to work on that. Very competitive. <laughs> Which I love that being an in influential force. Yeah, um, no, it's the truth. Well, how has your experience at Reddit and working with other startups influenced your approach now to investing and also just working with founders today? Because I mean, this it's a group of people with really big ideas and really big yeah. ambitions, and so. What, do you, what would you say is different about how you work with them? I, I really hope, I mean, you should ask them, because hopefully, they'll, maybe they'll call me on my BS here, but I'm really trying to be a lot more thoughtful um, and say a lot of the things that I didn't have, uh, I didn't have advisors or, or whatnot to tell me. Um, it was also still very early. I mean, 2005, doing a startup was not normal. Like today, it's like starting a band. Everyone's got one, which is good. I'm, I'm happy there's that culture of entrepreneurship. Um, but also means there's just a lot of noise. And, and I really want, I think one of the things that I think about a lot, and actually, oh, uh, so it's not even a humble brag, it's just a brag. I got to hang out with, with Coach Bennett. And, Whoa! right? I mean, wow. Like, I mean, this guy, he's awesome, to say the least. And, uh, and this was one thing that came up, and it was like, I, to be in his presence, it just, got me, it just got me thinking over and over again about how um, here is someone who coached up a team that had to go through something excruciating a year ago. And, and to hear about the way that he used it as motivation, as, a, as an opportunity to get these young men to start thinking about pain as opportunities for growth and really place and ground themselves for this season. Um, I can't help but say that, and I shared this with him too, because I was like, look, um, sport is beautiful because there are winners and there are losers and, and it's a pretty darn level playing field and, and we get to see when, when, when someone is the champion, when someone is number one, like they are number one and that's it. And, and in business, y'all MBAs, you know this, right? We're all just kind of making this stuff up. Like we can have, we've got Forbes lists, we've got Midas lists, we've got uh, we've got market caps, we can measure all kinds of things, but we're all just kind of making it up because all these other different factors that play in. But sport is beautiful because it is, it is about as objective as we can get. And to see the impact of, of what great coaching can do for an organization to, to, in this case, young men, but more broadly, the top athletes, men and women, all of them have some form of coaching in their lives, right? They have specialists, they have, they have, they have people who, from nutrition to strength training to all this stuff, right? There are coaches in their lives. And even though they might be the greatest ever, we expect that. We would be shocked if UVA had taken the floor in the finals without their coaching staff, right? We'd be like, what the hell's going on? And yet, for so many CEOs, for so many people in so many other industries, the idea of coaching is, is is surprising, it's shocking. We are so arrogant to think like, why would I need that? Of course I know what I'm doing, right? It's, it's, it's surprising because that's just the start of it. And when you start going into not just, not just, I think more and more CEOs and founders taking advantage of mentorship, of executive coaching, but then even starting going deeper and saying, all right, well, there's a huge mental component to being successful, whether it is at sport or at business. So why are we not talking more about mental health? Why are we not talking more about therapy? Why are all these different ways for an executive to get coaching so foreign, pretty broadly, to the industry? And it is changing. I think it's changed a lot even just in the last year or two. But there's this... Uh, there's a toxic culture of, 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 of sort of self-sacrifice and then you know, posting about it on Instagram. And, and it's absurd. 
it is absurd um, because the very people who are objectively the best at the thing that we all agree, sport, which is like pretty damn objective, all rely on rest as much as they do yeah. work. It well, would be inconceivable yeah. to think, to, to imagine like, yeah, I've just been up, uh, you know, two weeks straight grinding. Like you would never. I'm glad you, you segued into this because I think okay. this Good, idea I get of. <laughs> Like, and I, I love provoking a rant. And I want, well, and I want, and I want, <laughs> the, I I want these stories to get the misinformation. Um, this idea of hustle culture online uh, is yeah. kind of entering the consciousness more, and I think it matters a lot for people who are yeah. about to graduate um, and enter the workforce to hear this. Um, and like that, this kind of group of people online who are saying, you know, work constantly, like up and at them every single day. I mean, yeah. how did this sort of start getting on your nerves, and when did you start kind of observing it in the sort of um, would you say, and would you say it's kind of part of the startup world? Like it kind of sure. blossomed from that? Yeah, I think, I mean, there's definitely flavors of it coming from finance for sure, but we weaponized it in tech because we're all so good at social. <laughs> because it became this kind of like performance art. Uh, I call it hustle porn. Uh, and actually the Times had a really good piece on it. Mm -hmm. Like there, it has it is, it is definitely entered the zeitgeist. And it's, it's frustrating because Look, it goes without saying, you have to work hard. If, if you wanna be great at whatever it is you wanna do, you've gotta work hard. Everyone knows that. Like that is, that should be table stakes. It, it, it's, sure, it bears repeating, but there is a difference between hard work, which absolutely happens, and there are periods where we have deadlines that need to get met and where you are, you're, you are grinding, you are hustling, right? You're sleep deprived for a number of days to get something done and over deadline, but there has to be a respite from that. There has to be a balance um, or else it becomes self-destructive, especially for the work that we humans are still exclusively great at, which is all the stuff that the robots are not gonna do. It requires creativity. It requires mental power that, that will be drained if you are depriving yourself of sleep, if you're not taking care of yourself physically, and I'm talking like even just basic exercise and movement, if you're not taking care of yourself with the stuff that you're putting in your body, like this is, this is not rocket science, um, but I think somewhere along the way, it just became really valuable or lucrative or cool to, to push this as an idea. And it's easy. It's easy for investors to say, yeah, you should be working yourself to death. It, it, should, it, it, is, it is easy for that culture to get created and reinforced because they're not the ones really paying. They, I would argue they're paying the price in the long term because their companies are being less successful, um, but they're not paying the price in the short term. And, uh, and so if I can help dispel that, then that's good. How do you consciously do that with the people you're working with? I mean, are you connected, I tell them like, to go saying away. you should? <laughs> I, tell them, I tell them we had, um, I mean, I, I guess I can. Well, we, so we had a company recently launching um, uh, a product. Yeah, I can tell you. So they're recently launching a product. And, uh, and it was another classic example where it's like you have a deadline. And, and for the week leading up to it, the team that was leading that project were just all hours, all in. And the day after launch, launch day goes well, everything is good, goes, good, goes good, and I'm catching up the CEO, and he said to me, and I was, I was very proud of him, um, he was like, I told the whole team, like, do not come into work. You have, it was probably like a Wednesday now, like, just the rest of the week, just be from home. Like, if, if something comes up, we'll, we'll reach out to you. But we live in an age where we have these infernal devices on us at all times that, like, if something needs to get done, it will get done, mm -hmm. but it's a priority to take care of yourself because, I mean, again, it's, actually, it's, in the, it's in the selfish best interests of the CEO because they're gonna be able to get an employee not just for the next year, not just until their vesting is done, but for a much longer time. Uh, and, and frankly, it's the same reason why paid family leave has become a, a, a thing for me um, because I do think all American workers deserve it. But, but more importantly, I think we have companies that can start taking the initiative now while the federal government catches up. Um, because it's the same story. There's, there's no good, having gone through the process myself, I took my full leave. It was only 16 weeks at the end of the day, and if you start looking internationally, it's an embarrassingly small amount, but it was 16 weeks. And I took it all, and I made a big deal out of it, and I had sales guys coming up to me after, like commission-driven, hard-charging, who afterwards, when I came back, were like, bro, I'm gonna have a kid. I'm gonna take my whole leave. I mean, they're not like surfers, but Why like- Why do they talk like that? I don't know. It's my bro voice. And, and they were hyped. 
because they were like, I'm going to take my whole leave. I can't wait. I want to be there. It's my first baby. I'm so thrilled. And then, like, they cracked a Red Bull, and it was great. And, <laughs> but, wait, like, so you can see, the, you can see right. the effects of it, and, and the, there are so many long-term benefits. Uh, that's a whole other thing I can go into. Which, too. I mean, I hope, talk I about. very much hope that changes before I have a kid one day. What's the, <laughs> do, we, what, do we know what the time, what's the times policy? Who do we got to talk to? Oh, let's get, the, let's get the times paid leave policy we'll, on board. We'll route that to our right? higher ups and change. I mean, the that's subject. not on you. I don't know who I have to talk to at the times, but like, I'm the, actually, I'm not sure. I think it's pretty good. I, look, it's, I, I'm going to find out for you. We're going to get this settled. Alexis is on it. it. It's just like there, there is, and 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 so part of it's just having it in in place, um, and and then part of it's also taking advantage of it, especially for the dudes out there. So if you are lucky enough to have a paid family leave policy or if you are like a man who has a baby, you take the time um, or you can take the time. I encourage you wholeheartedly to take it all, brag about it, post about it on social. Like the, the part of changing the culture is about normalizing this behavior, which is not babysitting uh, when a dad does it. I still get I get pissed when I see a headline of some paparazzi photo of me with Olympia and they're like, Oh, Hanyan babysitting son, blah, blah. And I'm just oh, like... Oh, yeah, the babysitting is the worst. I'm a dad. They're I'm dadding. Place. You can say I'm dadding. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> but like... Or it, hanging with child. Like, yeah. You know? And, and what, what is encouraging, though, is, again, I feel like there's a generation coming up. And, and I'm fortunate, too, because all actually my childhood friends, like I, I look through my, my feed, and I do see a lot of friends of mine on the weekends like hanging out with their kid. And it's... It is a, a, a normalization of behavior that is obviously going to do a lot of good for women because it, it, it right, removes the stigma of uh, a woman getting pregnant and taking time off if men are taking it just as much. Um, but it's also really important if we believe that family values matter in this country, if we believe that, that uh, uh, it, is, it is vital, especially when your family goes through a huge change, like having a kid to have the whole squad there at the fort. Um, then it's an important thing to do. And, and like I said, the bar is just so damn low. I mean, we get the babysitting that pisses me off. People get praised just for acknowledging they have a goddamn kid. Like, that is how low the bar is for men. It is a bar. It is and, a bar. And that is so sad. It's so pathetic. So, like, let's not do that. And, uh, and it'll be better. I, I guarantee, like, you will never get that. All, all, all my dad's told me, they said, you will never get that time back. It'll change your life. Take as much of it as you can. And they're all right. And, and none of them, thank God, had to go through what we did with uh, the birth of our daughter and what my wife had to go through physically. And I could not have imagined worrying about my job security while we were going through with that. I mean, it, 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 I mean my wife nearly died in childbirth. Um, this is not news. But to have, have, have watched that, to have, have been there to help with the recovery, to, like, to have thought even for a second that my job was at stake would have been crushing. And we had every advantage imaginable this country. We had all the wealth you could hope for. We had all of the family support you could hope for. I mean, we had everything going for us. And it was still such a traumatic experience that I don't know how we in good conscience are okay with knowing that. I, mean, it's one, I think it's one in four women are back to work in a couple of weeks in this country. Uh, one in four women in the United States back to work in two weeks after having a kid. And, and, and it's crushing to imagine that. And so it's, it will become a, a moral obligation within the next year or two that I think we will fulfill. I think there will be a federal law about it. But in the meantime, the private sector, like, let's, let's lead the way and, uh, and take advantage of it, please. Well, I think that's really cool advice coming from you. So before we go to the student questions, mm. okay. I'm going to do a hard pivot here okay. to Kwe Kwe. Mm. Mm. Can you explain what Kwe Kwe is to the, maybe the people here who don't know? It's uh, my daughter's doll who has an Instagram account and a Twitter. She's very busy. Um, more than 100,000 Instagram followers. Yeah, doll. She, she's going to be more popular than me soon, and I'm okay with that. Olympia is already more popular than me on Instagram, and that's fine. Everyone, everyone hopes that their children can like, surpass them. I just didn't, I didn't so know it soon. would happen yeah, that fast. Um, 
But Quay Quay will soon too, I'm sure. Who, ri who writes the captions of Quay Quay? Quay Quay does. Why does no one, <laughs> no one wants to give Quay Quay her due? This is my big investigative journalism moment. I got I you. Failed. I got you, Quay Quay. No one respects you, but she's her own doll. Where, where was Quay Quay purchased? Uh, I don't know. She just showed up. My and wife, my so wife has coy. her ways, and and uh, she was really. It was. It was actually. So there, there's there's a story about this because, um, I mean we. We wanted a doll for our daughter. Uh, Serena was like, we're getting a black doll. I was like, right on, all right. <laughs> and, and like, I, I think one of the things that has been, it's been so interesting, because I'm, I'm still not sure why people love Quay Quay as much as they do. Um, but one of the things that does make my heart grow is knowing that, like, this is a doll that people seem to really love. And, and who knows, I mean, Quay Quay will no doubt continue to keep being awesome and keep getting followers and whatnot. Um, but there's a part of me that also, take, that also delights in knowing that, um, that here's this black doll that lots of people love. Um, because I remember taking, I think it was a cognitive science class here at UVA, first year, maybe second year, I think it was first year. And I remember learning about the doll test. And y'all know about the doll test? Oh, break, it, it, it is. Heartbreaking. It was, uh, I think it was originally in the 50s, they ran the first experiment to show the effects of discrimination. And, uh, and, and, and you watch these little girls, these little girls and boys, point which one's the smart doll and which one's the dumb doll and which one's the beautiful doll, which one's the ugly doll. And to see little black girls talk that way um, and feel that self hate because of the system they were raised in. And, and, and one where they're, they're you know, they're. They're, they're raised in loving households, right? But they're seeing these signals from culture and from society. Um, it's crushing to watch. And then you, you start seeing that those tests continue to be done decade after decade after decade. And the results are not as bad, but they're still bad. And, and so there's a, little, there, there's a little part of me that still sits back in the cognitive science class thinking like, all right, you know what? There is something, um, there's something satisfying about having Quay Quay be such a popular doll, just in general. Um, and and I'm, I'm grateful my wife had such a good idea uh, because I do think there's, um, there's, there's room to be better. Uh, there's absolutely room to be better, and so I'm happy that Quay Quay can, can keep doing that. Yeah. I, I love that we got to talk about Quay Quay. Um, I'm sure she does too. She's, <laughs> she's probably, probably live tweeting this. This is, on, this is streaming on Twitter? I, streaming, yes. Yes? Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, that's cool. Hopefully, hopefully she's hopefully she's watching. watching. I, I hope. Um, Past her bedtime. So I'm sorry. Well, okay. I'd love to go to the student questions. So we'll be alternating between um, folks here asking in person and um, with the video uh, live streaming. So I think our first question is coming from the video, which we'll play here. Hi, my name is Daniel Moreira, and I'm a senior at Suffolk University. My question for Alexis is, what is your advice for women who are thinking of going into the tech industry? All right. Um, this one is very complicated. Um, the tech industry has historically, actually originally, was full of women developers. Uh, and then that shifted. And and has been improving, but it's still very hard, very hard to, to not just break in, but also then want to stay. Um, I think the good news is it is top of mind for more of these large companies than ever, now more than ever, in part because a lot of journalists basically keep bringing it up, keep forcing diversity reports, and keep getting people to have to talk about it. Um, the good news is, I think the larger companies have gotten a lot better, and, and what I've heard from women who are working there and, and leading a lot of the outreach is that it has gotten a lot better. Um, Caitlin Holloway, incidentally, if you all want to gig at Reddit, um, who runs our people and culture, um, has done an amazing job in the last five years to really shift that, especially at Reddit, um, and make it a better place for women, um, and also continue to increase, well, make it a better place for everyone, but, but especially women. And, uh, and I think the opportunity here is to not give up. And I hate that that's the advice I have to give, but the reality is, um, coming from me, like there's only, I don't know, I'm not, the, not even the right person to answer the question because so many 
there are so many amazing women in tech right now who are forming organizations and communities and doing the kind of mentorship that is going to help fix this that I, I, I want to be a useful ally, but at the end of the day, like, I, um, the, the, the hard reality is a lot of it is, is just, unfortunately, um, keep working to make it better and, and know that there are resources, there are organizations, there are lots of ways to build networks, which I think are key to this. Um, we backed a company called Girl Boss. Um, Sophia's done an amazing job building a network of ass-kicking professional women. Um, I obviously think that would be a great one to join, um, also because it's digital. But, um, but the reality is there's still a lot to do and there's no easy answer because the, the, the industry still needs a lot of work. Um, question two, here. Hi, I'm Allie. Hello. My question is, how do you overcome the fear of getting started? Oh, I, the, the, the part I, I want to incept in your head and anybody else's who's worried is no one cares. And <laughs> no, what I mean is, no, what I, well, no, I, well, hold on. No, I care. Okay. What I, what I, I'm going to make sure I get this right. What I mean is the, the, the fear, there, there were so many things that I did not share with the world that I was worried about. I don't know, I was worried what, what people thought. And the reality was, when you are starting out, no one actually cares. Like you were gonna spend so much time actually getting someone to care that, that the, the first couple of times it might sting, it might, it might, you're gonna feel that anxiety, you're gonna feel that everything, but, but like anything, the more repetition, the better. And, and very quickly, you'll start to find a few people who actually do care, and they'll give you some feedback on it. And you realize that wasn't so bad. Uh, and actually, people tend to be fairly polite about it, too. You'll actually have to press them for the really hard feedback to help make it better. Um, but, but please, like, I think, so long as your interests are good, and I assume your interests are good, because, you know, you're a Wahoo, um, we need more people who feel comfortable creating and sharing, especially now more than ever. Um, it, we, we need more good ideas. We need more good things to be started. Sure. Um, and number three, our question will come from video. How are you doing? My name is Matthew Cruz. So I'm a sophomore at Bryant University. And my question for Alexis is, how are you able to maintain a healthy balance between your professional ventures and your personal life? Oh, my man. I'm so happy. This is great. Because, you know, if I, were, uh, if I were a mom, you know, exec, I'd be asked this question every day, every interview, right? How do you balance work and family? And... And I'm so grateful that I'm starting, I'm really starting to get asked this question more and more. And I hope, I, I like, please ask me all day long because why shouldn't a business dad be asked this question? Like, yeah, um, I, like I, it, is, it is very hard. Um, I'm not great at it. I always feel like I'm not doing enough. And practically speaking, I mean, I could not exist. My relationship, my family, all that could not exist without like Google Calendar, FaceTime, and, and, and lots of, of, of patience, frankly, um, on both our parts. And you know, my wife, you all may know, has a very demanding job. Uh, she also is very smitten with our daughter, which I adore, and so the two of them are pretty much inseparable. Um, and so what that means is I'll, I'll be gone for a week. Um, I, I keep weekends sacred best I can, but I'll be gone for five days, like I am right now. We'll be back till Friday night. And, and it's frustrating at times, especially when there's like, there could be seven, eight, nine time zones between us and we're missing each other all day long and we'll make sure to, to slot Google Calendar. We have both of our EAs conspire to slot Google Calendar times. So my wife doesn't know this, but um, <laughs> I have them conspiring so that we slot times in when I know she'll be free and I'll be free for me to just call her. And we sneak them in so that like we can just like serendipitously like, oh, hey, I was just thinking about you and I called you. <laughs> You're free? Like, great. Um, and <laughs> I mean, now, I mean, she's not, I don't know if she'll watch this. Just, Modern you know, love. Don't tweet her. I know, but, and, and look, and I know coming to this, we have a ton of advantages um, that other couples don't, but I really, the thing I try to come back to is uh, as career driven as I am, as career driven as I know my wife is, um, we really want to make this a priority and, and it's a fight and it's always going it, to, I'm sure it's always going to be a struggle, um, but I want to make sure that I'm there and I show up when she counts on me. 
and I know I can get the same out of her. And Olympia is too young to notice, but at some point, <laughs> I want her to know that, that I show up when, when I need to and when she knows I'll be there. That's really nice. Um, yeah. Hi, my name is Kat, and I am curious, what is your favorite thread to follow on Reddit? You know, I try not to use Reddit that much because I want to, I, I, this is the advantage of being a, a parent now is I really have to really be careful with my time. Um, the, uh, I still dip in to Dadit, which is the, the Reddit community of dads. Uh, and I'm official, so I can be a member. Um, that's the, I mean, that, that, that one is nice because if Instagram is where everyone goes to show the, like, nice photo of like our day at the park. Um, our slash dad it is where they go to talk about like the horrible, horrible day at the park. <laughs> like the rest of the day at the park, like after the photo. And because it is raw and authentic and candid and so in that way it's like kind of cathartic. Um, so yeah, shout out to dad it. Hey, yeah. It's a great name. Yeah. Um, and now we have a video question. Hi, my name is Rohan Dixit, and I'm a junior at Boston College, coming to you live from Dublin, Ireland. Now, we've all had friends and mentors who have profoundly impacted our lives. So my question for Alexis is, who in your life has shaped your journey as a person and an entrepreneur the most? And what have you done to express your gratitude or repay them for their positive impact? Thank you. Mm. I wish I had a good, like, business mentor answer for this. Um, Jessica Livingston took a chance on us. She was the one who said we need to invest in these two, even when they rejected our original idea. She's one of the founders and partners at Y Combinator. She never gets enough credit. She's the one who picked Reddit, not Paul Graham, and, and in a lot of ways helped make Y see what it was. So I always give her her due. Um, but really, I think one of the things I've, I've had to get good at is Ha cribbing ideas and cribbing inspiration from a bunch of different, sometimes very unconnected, random places. Because I can't say that I have like a phone a friend mentor. I can't say there was someone. And look, I know I'm also I'm also a white dude who's basically walked into every room feeling like I kind of belong there. And so I realize it's easy for me to say this, but like the honest truth is, yeah, I don't. I, there's if I were to point to anyone again, the reason it's not going to be satisfying is because I would say my mother and my father. Um, but, uh, but I did tell them that all that, why well, I, I, my mother's passed, but I, I, I told her that a lot. Um, and my dad, I still, I mean, I feel like, I don't I, I should, I should sit down with him. I sat down with him for a podcast recently and I told him what an inspiration he was with that little travel agency that could. Um, but to my mom's credit, um, that was a perspective that I got at 23 no, 22 when she was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer, that uh, we were in the middle of Reddit and we had just gotten started. I was feeling invulnerable, actually, because I just graduated from here and I thought, I got the world in my hands, we got this. And uh, it was a very humanizing experience because not only did it happen, um, she felt apologetic about it. Her first words to me were, I'm sorry, after the diagnosis, because she knew how much uh, you know, how much it would affect me, obviously, because I'm her son. Um, but she felt a responsibility because she knew I was starting this company and, and, and had the courage and the, the selflessness to even have that be the first words out of her mouth. And so she always went out of her way to make sure that she was providing for me. Um, even when she came here, I mean, my mom was undocumented. Um, when I hear these stories, now see, I'm getting my soapbox. I hear these stories about people getting pulled out of their homes and I think my mom overstayed her visa by three years. And, and so the person I think about when I see the headline is my mom. And I'm like, well, wait, first, there'd be no Reddit. So come on. That's a, if there's any reason to abolish ICE, it's that we could keep Reddit. Um, but, but to have that, um, the only context I have for it is, yes, yeah, she overstayed it because she wanted a family here and she wanted a life here. And... Uh, and to think of all the things she sacrificed to start over in a new culture with a new language um, for, for a better life for her family seems like exactly what we would want here. And so what I got when she lived such a giving life 
and selfless life. And then as she was approaching death and had the time to really take inventory about the things that mattered over the next few years, um, none of the shit, none of the shit that wasn't people or experience mattered at the end of the day. The only thing she wanted were people around her who loved her and, and the memory of and the stories about the experiences that we shared. And so when you are, I mean, I was sitting, I mean, Reddit was everything. Reddit was my life. I, I knew at this moment we could not fail in a lot of ways um, because I was given the superpower of, of, of knowing that our worst days as founders, though my worst day as a CEO was never going to be as bad as her worst day. And I don't have to go through chemo. I don't have to deal with this. No, no, I had a great day today. And... And so it gave me, I don't know, we'd be, in the, we'd be in the trenches with Dig and some of these other competitors, and I wasn't worried for a minute because they didn't have the superpower of perspective uh, of knowing really what a hard day would look like. And, and having someone supporting you, even while they were going through that, uh, was, a, was a superpower. And so, yeah, the, 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 the perspective that she gave me at such a young age when I was so full of energy and optimism and vigor, uh, and then to come into the wealth that I was fortunate enough to come into not long thereafter when we sold Reddit, um, it, it, it kept me so grounded because none of the things uh, that mattered uh, were things that I was gonna buy. Um, none of the things that mattered were, were the things that, uh, that really were affected by any of that. The, the things that mattered were the, the people that I had closest to me and the experiences I was sharing with them. And so I, I'm so grateful because it still gives me perspective every day when I'm making decisions about what I want to be doing with my life, and uh, and I want to I don't want to honor that because uh, I was given a tremendous gift and a responsibility to live up to it, and uh, and that's been I mean that's a, that's an ongoing mentorship session uh, that I get every time uh, I talk to her every time that I you know, in my head talk to her, and uh, and it means a lot. Yeah, it means a lot. Yeah. Hi, my name's Avery. I was wondering how you suggest recovering from a failed idea. Ooh, uh, come up with 10 more. I don't know, I think uh, post-mortems, I mean, if you're really wanting into the weeds of it, um, I'm a big fan of post-mortems. I'm a big fan of talking about exactly what, what went wrong. Um, I try, I really try, and I hope my team will call me out when I don't do it, but I really try to take total ownership of anything. Um, even, even things that are, I, like I, I want to default to here are all the things that I did wrong, here are all the things that I can do better. And if I, I feel like if I'm starting, if I'm starting from this place, it is, it, it is giving me clear directive for what I can be doing better and it makes the people around me sort of think similarly. Um, and, and I generally feel most of the time it is probably my fault anyway. Um, because that's the responsibility you bear as a leader, right? It, it starts and ends with you at the end of the day. So, uh, so yeah, do that postmortem, take full responsibility, and know that we're just full of fuck ups. We we will fail far more times than we will succeed, but that's that's okay. Awesome. Um, and our next question comes from video from uh, Darcy at the University of Florida. Hi, I'm Darcy, and I go to the University of Florida, and Alexis, I'm wondering what a day in your life looks like. Oh, I mean, I should do a vlog or something. Um, <laughs> I don't know, what I, I mean, today I was walking around grounds, meeting up with people, got a couple pitches on the street, uh, got a bagel at Bodo's, that's okay, that's calm, I, I, I love it, I like, like five years ago, six years ago, it would just be, well, it would be like Reddit, like, hey, I love Reddit. Then it was like, hey, uh, let me pitch you my startup. Then it was, hey, I love your wife. <laughs> and now people just scream quay quay at me. <laughs> but, As they should. But it's a fairly, I mean, I, I feel like, I don't know, where's Lizzie? What do we do? We just, we meetings, phone calls, what, talk what you, to a lot of Monday founders. Like? Monday? Yeah, it's past Monday. Uh, wait, when I was drunk in Minneapolis? <laughs> was that? That was last month. Yeah, that was, yeah. Yeah, I had a good time. That was not a work-related. I took a personal day, uh, for sure. Um, but no, it's, it's like remarkably, I don't know, it's, it's, I, 
it's, I think it's pretty boring overall. I enjoy it thoroughly, but I, I get to spend a lot of time with founders and, and just asking them questions, trying to help create solutions uh, and sort of better understand the world. That's it. A lot of coffee. <laughs> Drink Coffee's a lot of good. coffee, yeah. Um, our in-person question here. How's it going? Uh, my name is Shafad. I'm a fourth year at UVA. Uh, given your kind of background mm -hmm. in humanities, and I believe you were in the comm school as well. Yes. If you, sorry about that. <laughs> if, you right. got, if you got to design or create your own class within yeah. UVA, what would it be and why? Ooh, what would the class, I could be any class I want. There's only a couple of classes I'm qualified to teach. It could be that you teach it or you build a curriculum. Oh. I think whoa. you'd be a good teacher. I mean, I, oh, thank you. I would like to, oh, there's definitely classes I would like to take. Um, but the, okay, let me, let me, the easier one to answer will be the one that I would, I would want to curate. Um, I would want to, actually, we I had a conversation about this a little bit today. I would want to do some take on entrepreneurship where I want it to be applicable even if you never consider being an entrepreneur because I think the same skills that will make you successful as an entrepreneur, or at least not terrible as an entrepreneur, are the same skills that will make you not terrible as a fill in the blank, whatever it is. Um, and so, so a lot of this really just comes down to problem solving. A lot of it comes down to exercising these muscles of like relentlessness, um, of being able to self-teach, of, it would be a really easy curriculum. I would just be like, figure some stuff out. Or maybe I would force, <laughs> I'd force the students to create it. I don't know. I think um, some part of it would be about communicating, both written and verbally. Um, some part of it would be around the, 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 a lot of the balance that we were talking about earlier, where I think no matter what your job ends up being, you're never going to be able to do it at your best unless you're actually taking care of yourself holistically, mentally, physically, what, spiritually. Whatever all that means to you, you need to be taking care of yourself. Um, and, and I hate the fact that I only started when I found out I was going to be a dad. Um, but that was, that was it. That was the moment. I was like, oh, I really got to. I need, I, need, I need to make it at least 34 years from now. I was 30, 34, 30, I was like, I got to make it at least 34 more years. So I need to, need to start getting right. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it'd be some version of that. Uh, and then maybe there'd be a photography class too. Cause I just, I feel like everybody's Instagram game could use just like a little, <laughs> little bump up. Well, so, savage critique of the people you follow. <laughs> I just, I, no, I mean everybody broadly. I feel like it's such a, it's a beautiful thing that everyone now has. Y'all don't even remember, you were kids. Film used to be a big deal. Like when the, fil when the camera came out, my dad was like, all right, get serious now. Like we're not wasting this. Like we will get doubles. But like, we're, we're not going to waste this. Now everyone is, is blessed with an amazing, amazing camera. And most of us are really mediocre at taking photos. So I just think, I, look, and that's not a critique. I mean, it's just the reality. So I think, I think it's, it would be, it'd be a worthwhile little uh, sort of uh, extra course in the, uh, in the curriculum, photography. I'm going to ask you for some Instagram tips backstage. Sure. I mean, I'm not saying I'm great at it. I'm trying, I, the reason I carry around a camera most of the time is because I want to get better. And, uh, I love it. So, so some of you, if there's some photography, is photography a major here at UVA? No? Okay, well, <laughs> photography experts, if you want to critique my gram, please do. Like, leave it in the comments. I will not delete them. I need the feedback. Nice. Um, and here's our second to last question, which will come from video. Hi, my name is Macy Kaiser, and I'm a senior at Western Kentucky University. And my question for Alexis is, can you provide a couple tips on what to do and what not to do when you're first starting a business right outside of school? Mm. You should absolutely, excuse me, you should absolutely want to have founders who are not just your friends. It's so tempting to just go start a startup or start a company with your friend because you know, they spend a lot of time with them. They're fun to hang out with. Um, that should not be the only criteria. You'd be much better off uh, starting a company with someone who you've done some class projects with, who you get along fine with, but where the, the key thing to optimize for is not purely like, hey, we're good friends, but this is a person who has complementary skills in some way, shape, or form. They, they do things I can't do, and, and there are attributes about them that I aspire to. This person makes me want to be better. In fact, all the people you surround yourself with should make you want to be better for certain reasons. If not, 
you should probably not be friends with them. And, and if that makes some of the rides home tonight awkward, <laughs> then fine. But, but like you really are the average of your closest friends. And so even, I know some of y'all are like, oh, this is gonna be really awkward. <laughs> but, but you're the average of your closest friends. And, and, and especially if you wanna do entrepreneurship, it becomes even more important because your circle just default gets smaller because you have, you, you, they're only, they're only, you'll find yourself gravitating towards the other weirdos who've decided to be entrepreneurs who can relate to your experience and there's just a smaller circle of those people. So optimize for those folks. Um, and then also bonus points, if they overlap with you on your value slash worldview. Um, and that doesn't mean like, I'm not saying like, find someone who's like your carbon copy of like D&D &D alignment, but but, but make sure the things that motivate you or the things that drive you are similar because we see lots of founders, they're good buddies in college, they start a startup, they get to a certain point and they realize they have very different sort of, they have a very different value system. And so when a company is going poorly, it doesn't really matter because the company goes to zero. But, but it, it's interesting when the company does well or starts showing signs of growth, there, there comes a time for decisions to be made where if that does not overlap well, you will eventually start drifting. And, and so it's more important than ever to, to optimize for the, the more sort of objective things rather than just we're friends. Um, because you're gonna have to be able to have hard conversations with your co-founders all the time. And the, the sooner you can do that, the better. And it's just often easier to have those conversations with people that you're not like, you haven't streaked the lawn with. Um, that's not, not required. Um, but it's a thing. Do people still do that? Yes. Okay. All right. I was again. I was. I'm worried. I'm like the old guy now, and everyone's gonna be like, "We don't. We don't do that anymore." That's that's weird. Okay. Never did it, by the way. Not. Nope. Not planning on it. <laughs> no, Alexa says thank it you. is too late. Definitely not. <laughs> um, and thank you for being patient. And here's our final student question. Right on. Hi, I'm Hello. Bill Gay, and um, I'd like to know, what do you think is the most important quality in a young entrepreneur? Mm, the most important quality. Well, so I, I think that's why this would be heavily featured in the 101 class, but I, I think there's gonna be, there is this trait, uh, there's this trait of how one deals with adversity um, going back to this sort of relentlessness, this ability to adapt to difficult situations, that is really, really crucial. And okay, y'all, y'all, some of y'all will appreciate this, some of you will hate this, but we see founders who come out of top universities who have amazing grades, phenomenal grades. We all had to have great grades to get here, but then they also like amazing grades here. But when confronted with the harsh realities of the market, and, and entrepreneurship, which is full of failure, and there's no syllabus, there's no professor to go talk to afterwards to renegotiate the grades, which I didn't know was a thing. I went, to, I went here for four years, and then it was after I graduated that I learned that, that was a thing, uh, where you could renegotiate your grade, I didn't know. Yeah, I know, yeah. But the point is, they, they enter a universe where there is no longer strict criteria, there's no longer a kind of get out of jail free card, and they're met with failure over and over and over and over again, which is the life of the entrepreneur, and, and they, they crumple under it. Uh, and that, that's not all, that's not all the kids who go to top schools and have top grades, but it's a, it's a mentality that comes from getting really good at how to game a system, and, and, and it works, it clearly works very well, and there are probably lots of careers where that continues to work really well, but for entrepreneurship, there's nothing to game. The free market doesn't care, like it doesn't care, and so, it's how you deal with the setbacks, it's how you deal with the failure, it's how you deal with the fact that you feel like you're totally alone in this whole thing. Um, and then the, even the data you're getting back is really limited and really murky. Um, it's how comfortable you are operating in that environment that really has a huge impact. So that is the, that is the trait. Um, but the good news is y'all can start doing this while you're still students. I mean, even like, I don't know, just coming up with a Kickstarter campaign to help your artist friend who doesn't have a clue how to do one of those things. Like, you can find opportunities to get this sort of the, the low-hanging fruit of entrepreneurship where you basically have ideas and do them. Um, you can find those things even around grounds. And, and the, you know, where this kind of started, you're, you're kind of shoved together with a bunch of people who I hope are from all over the world and I hope are from all kinds of different backgrounds and who 
can bring to you a very different perspective uh, and an opportunity to learn a little bit more about yourself, but also about some industry that you never knew about or some, some thing you never knew about. And, and this is the best place to find co-founders. Um, and it's much easier. You don't have to, but it is much easier to go on the journey with someone else. Thank you. Sure. Um, and that is... And I feel like that's an awesome note to end this awesome conversation. So thank you so thank much, you. Alexis, and thank you everyone thank for coming. You so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming.